Hi everybody, this is Bruce here. Welcome to my YouTube channel, Traveling with Bruce. Please subscribe to my channel today and become a key supporter of Traveling with Bruce by clicking the Patreon link. Enjoy the video. Hey everybody, how you doing? It's Bruce here, Traveling with Bruce. You know, everybody loves a good story and today is story day. I'm not going to talk about traveling, uh, although I am in a way talking about traveling, but uh, this isn't a traditional video like I normally make. This one is a story, I hope you like it. It involves the Beatles, John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and my dad. So there's your teaser line right there, okay? The Beatles and my dad. How they made my dad's world totally. They changed it completely. Okay, let me quickly uh, give you an idea of what's going on here and, and, and give you some context to this story. First of all, while the Beatles were popular in Britain, the United Kingdom, they were, they were certainly, uh, Beatlemania was spreading in 1963 in the UK. Uh, they were conquering Europe, but they had not made it to America yet. Uh, they were trying to, but uh, Capitol Records wasn't promoting their records yet, but it's a story that's public knowledge. The Beatles hadn't yet broken out. Okay, that's 1963. In 1963, my father was a traveling salesman for a music company, and he was living in uh, uh, Bay Ridges, Ontario, which is just east of Toronto, Ontario. And he was servicing Southern Ontario uh, as a territory for this company that was selling what we call wind instruments, uh, predominantly to um, uh, the buyers, and buyers would be like uh, high school students that were part of the high school band. Uh, he also sold violins and cellos and, and, and uh, violas, that type of thing. So he was making a living, not a great living, but making a living. And to cut to the chase, at the end of 1963, he was in line for a bonus if he hit a certain sales number for orders. And he knew that if he worked his tail off in the summer and the fall of 1963, he would earn this bonus and it would be substantial. And no salesman had ever done it before in the company. No one. No one had ever done it before. And he took it as a personal challenge to make this happen. He hit the road and really worked his tail off. And he booked the required amount of, of business uh, by early December, uh, had submitted all of his orders, and uh, was expecting his bonus in the first uh, week of uh, January, 1964. Um, New Year's comes, the new, uh, the new year begins, and uh, he's informed uh, there's no bonus. And he's asking, why is there no bonus? And it turns out that the company um, had a rule that he didn't know about, or they claimed that the rule was always into effect, that just because he booked the orders didn't mean he would get paid on the orders. He would only be paid on instruments that were shipped out the factory door, out of the warehouse. And as they calculated it, he was close, but no cigar. He was about $500 away from making the bonus. And that's too bad and so sad. And that's just the way it is. Uh, to give you an idea how much money we're talking about here, this is serious stuff. I think the bonus in 1963 was upwards of $1,000. And uh, for $1,000, uh, you could almost buy a car for that. Uh, you could certainly buy a Volkswagen for that. I don't know if you could get a Chevy for that, but... Within a couple of hundred bucks, you could have had a Chevrolet for that kind of money. So that was a lot of money. Today's money, you know, 20, 25 grand. Uh, needless to say, my father left the position with the company. And uh, no other salesman would work for those guys because uh, there was a fraternity out there. And salesmen talked to salesmen about uh, who tra treated you right and who treated you wrongly. And this story became legend in the uh, wholesale music business for quite a number of years. These guys eventually uh, reorganized their company and they changed their ways, but it, it was eventually confirmed that they held back on purpose instruments so they wouldn't have to pay the bonus. They had the instruments in the warehouse the whole time. They just weren't going to ship them. They shipped them in January so that he didn't make the quota in December. A terrible story. Anyway, my dad's out of a job. 24 hours later, his phone is ringing and there's a gentleman on the phone from Montreal, Quebec, Mr. Ralph Mintz from the Ralph D. Mintz Musical Instrument Company, distributor of instruments. And he called my father and said, is it true that you are um, no longer working for so-and-so? He said, yeah, that's true. He said, um, would you be interested in uh, considering working for my company? And he said, yes, I would. I've heard of your company, uh, very good reputation. 
um, but I, uh, I have some prerequisites. And he said, um, uh, I would be willing to talk about anything you want to talk about. Uh, and over the phone, they talked for about 20 minutes. And as a young nine-year-old, I was hanging around listening to this conversation, Ke keeping quiet, of course, like a fly in the wall. And I'm listening to my father tell this gentleman that he was not interested in just being a salesman for Southern Ontario. That's what he did for the last company. He doesn't want to do that anymore. He wants the whole province of Ontario. Otherwise, no deal. Mr. Min said, no problem whatsoever. I have two guys. I've already fired one guy. He's absolutely useless. He didn't make any kind of money for me last year. The second guy can't stand his job. I'm getting rid of him. The whole province is yours if you want it. What kind of terms do you want? And my dad basically said, I want a straight commission only. I don't want any kind of tiered bonus structure, what have you. I just want 10% commission. That's it. And I want a thousand dollar bonus, uh, sorry, thousand dollar advance on the 15th of each month. That'll cover my expenses and my overheads. And uh, above that, uh, I get that. And Mr. Min said, deal. Uh, I haven't got a problem with that whatsoever. He said, I'll go one step further. Uh, any store in Ontario that orders instruments from us directly, you get 10% of that as well, whether you're there or not. Where some firms, they would only pay the salesman if the salesman physically took the order in person. If the customer phoned the factory with an additional order, the salesman would be shut out. Not in this case. Mr. Mintz paid the entire territory. My dad got 10%. My dad was very pleased with that. Now, I want to give you some background on Mr. Mintz. Why is this so important? Mr. Mintz was a, a businessman in Montreal who spoke fluent Japanese. One of the few people who could do that. And he flew to Japan at least twice a year to place orders with music manufacturing factories in Japan. They were making instruments there that we would call today knockoffs of the big American and German and, and European brands. So uh, a Gibson guitar, Fenders, uh, Rickenbackers, and all the other big brands these Japanese companies were making these kinds of products. In those days, Japan was known for cheap products. Uh, today, they're known for high-end products. But in those days, in the early 60s, Japan was desperate to grow their export business. And musical instruments was one area they were going into. Cameras and watches were eventually another. Televisions, of course, camcorders, and so on. Mr. Mintz was the first importer of musical instruments into North America from Japan. The first one ever to do it. He had a huge head start. The trick was, in 1963, however, the top musical acts were uh, Elvis Presley, who played an acoustic guitar sometimes, uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary, uh, three singers, one of which had an acoustic guitar, uh, Bob Dylan, uh, you know, and Arlo Guthrie, single performers with acoustic guitars. And uh, the music business was so-so. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, you didn't make a lot of money if you owned a music store because uh, everybody wanted to be like these guys. Everything changed on February the 9th, 1964, just five weeks after my dad joined Mr. Mintz's company. February the 9th, 1964 was my father's 35th birthday, Sunday. Ed Sullivan brought these four lads from Liverpool out on stage at the Ed Sullivan Theater in New York, and the Beatles were launched on America, and North America and the world. And for, of course, within days, Beatlemania struck all of North America. Three of the Beatles' songs were number one, two, and three on the charts, and there were a bunch more coming all, all of a sudden. And within a week of that performance, my father's phone was ringing off the hook from music stores. Mr. Mince's phone in Montreal was ringing off the hook. Every mom and pop music store across Canada, and in particular Ontario, were calling for instruments. And they needed electric guitars, electric bass guitars, drum sets, amplifiers, microphones, the whole deal. Because that's what the Beatles had. Every kid in high school wanted to become a musician. Tom Petty and Billy Joel both said that on the night of February the 9th, 1964, they knew from that moment on what they would do with the rest of their lives. They'd become performers. Because if the Beatles could do it, anybody could do it. This is fantastic. So my father <clears throat> was busy. And um, because of the Beatles, my father went on the road, uh, continued, continued on the road, and was selling instruments like you couldn't believe. A uh, Japanese guitar would retail for $99.99. It would wholesale for $50. It would be imported for $25. <laughs> so <laughs> Mr. Mintz brought it in for $25. My dad would sell it for $50. He'd get $5. Mr. Mintz would get $45 and make a ton of profit. The music store would sell it for $100. They'd make $50. They'd make a ton of profit. They couldn't keep it in stock. 
and my dad was getting orders for dozens of these instruments and drum sets uh, all at the same time. Drums, $199, bass guitars, 100 bucks. Some guitars sold for $79.99, some for $129.99. Amplifiers from 60 bucks to 150 bucks a piece. You could outfit an entire four piece band for probably uh, under a thousand bucks with four guys doing it. And with the help of mom and dad in those days, these young kids put these rock and roll groups together and every town in Ontario had them. And I'm sure in New York, Pennsylvania, across the United States, around the world. I asked my dad years later, dad, how much money did you make uh, in 1964, 1965, 1966, selling instruments on the road for Mr. Mintz? Uh, he said to me, well, uh, after expenses, I cleared $25,000 a year, every year, minimum. I said, how much was your house worth in 1964? Because we had a brand new house that we lived in just outside of Toronto. The house was $12,500. So I said, okay, let me get this straight. You were making the equivalent of two houses of money working as a traveling salesman selling musical instruments in Ontario in 1964, 65, 66. He said, yes, that's right. I said, how much is that house worth now? And I said, well, he told me at the time, but today it's 2017. The house today that we lived in in 1964 is $500,000. So in effect, he was making two houses worth of money a year that would be today $1 million a year because of the Beatles. They never met. The Beatles never met my dad. My dad never met them. Uh, but it was because of them and the breakout on the Ed Sullivan Show in front of 73 million people that my father became a well-to-do guy. Uh, Mr. Mintz made more. He made nine times as much as my dad, or ten times as much. And he was quite happy with everything as well. Mr. Mintz sold instruments across the country, not just in Ontario, by the way, but the Ontario was the market. My dad was the number one salesman. Um, within five years, my dad owned his own music store. Uh, that was worth about 150000 at the time. He owned a house at that point worth 30000 And so uh, $180,000 of assets, uh, not a bad uh, run from selling violins and violas and trumpets and getting ripped off for 1000 bucks uh, to that. And that's the story of the Beatles making my dad a very wealthy individual uh, in the early 60s. And it changed my life because when I was a teenager, I worked in my dad's music store. And that's how I became a uh, young salesman and eventually became a musician myself. Anyway, that's today's story. I hope you like it. Uh, I love it. And uh, thanks for tuning in on this uh, story today on my channel, Traveling with Bruce. Um, I'll keep them coming, I hope. Um, visit my Patreon page. Uh, support the channel if you like it. Please subscribe to my channel. Um, I'm going to keep the stories coming until they tell me to stop. And uh, we'll see you next time on Traveling with Bruce. See ya.